Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Wrong Way Shakedown. Above the entrance to the post office in New York City, there stands the slogan, Neither snow, nor rain, nor gloom of night stays these carriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. And while that is true of postmen everywhere, it is likewise true of almost every government employee. No member of your FBI knows where his next assignment will take him, into what jeopardy it will place him, or under what conditions he will have to work. But that does not deter him. For he knows that crime can and does take place anywhere and amongst all types of people. Sometimes those crimes are long planned and intricately carried out. And sometimes they are committed almost on the spur of the moment. There are more of the latter type because most criminals are not people of intelligence or character. They are more likely to be insensible opportunists who look only for the smallest of openings before they strike. Tonight's file opens on the lawn of an exclusive summer resort. Three people, an elderly lady and two younger men, are just finishing a furious game of croquet. Go ahead, Wilbur. It's your shot. I know. If you don't hit your mother's ball, the game is as good as over. I'm aware of that. Uh, here goes. <laughs> he missed. Go ahead, Mrs. Wheeler. It's your shot. Now, all I have to do is hit the stake with my ball. That's right. Well... Let's try it. Excellent, Meyer. Good shot. You're the champ, Mrs. Wheeler. That's the first time I ever played croquet. <laughs> Congratulations, Mrs. Wheeler. Thank you, dear. How do you feel? Oh, oh all tuckered out, dear. Mother, I think we'd better go up and have a cup of tea. That's a good idea, Wilbur. Would you two join us? Oh, not me. I'm going up and take a shower after all that exercise. But we'll see you in the dining room. Oh, that'll be nice. 
Maybe we can eat together. Mrs. Wheeler, my wife doesn't allow me to make dates with strange women. Oh, <laughs> <you> will. <laughs> we'll say goodbye for now, then. We'll see you later. Okay, so long. <laughs> Bill. Bill, you're overdoing it. They're gone. Oh. Well, how'd you make out? I think I hit the jackpot. What did you get on them? Well, I looked in her purse and couldn't get anything. But when Wilbur hung his coat over the chair I was sitting on, I came up with a real interesting letter. What kind of letter? A guy's being blackmailed. That goon? Uh Uh-huh. The letter told the whole story. He stole a diamond ring at the Hotel Central in Madison, Missouri. He's being shaken for $2,500. Well, I always say you never know where your next buck is coming from. What do you mean? Well, if he's being blackmailed, honey, we're getting in the act, too. Meanwhile, in the nearby local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Keith Johnson. Keith, it's never going to get cool again, is it? I don't think so. And the paper says we're due for more of the same tomorrow. Yeah. Say, Jim, what's this new case we're on all about? Extortion. We just finished with one extortion case. Well, that's why they gave us this one. What have we got so far? Not much. We don't have a description. We don't have a sample of the extortioner's handwriting, and we don't know where the extortioner is now. Dandy. Yeah, What's the operation? Well, it seems there was a reunion of the class of 28 of Madison University. A few of the old grads went out and celebrated pretty strenuously. Among them, one Mr. Rawlins. Nothing will strain you as much as trying to hold on to an old memory. Well, they found that out. The next morning, the house detective at the hotel knocked on the door of Mr. Rawlins' room. I see. He said that there was a valuable diamond ring missing from the next room, and he also said they had a report that Rawlins had wandered into that room the night before by uh, mistake. What did Rawlins say? Well, he actually didn't remember, and he had such a terrible hangover that he couldn't do any arguing. (laughs) Those 45-year-olds never learned that they can't drink that way anymore. Yeah. Well, the detective pretended to search the room, and in the pocket of Rollins' tuxedo, he found the missing ring. At least he claimed that's where he found it. Then when he said he might be able to straighten everything out, Rollins was only too happy to let him try. Uh Uh-huh. Well, after Rollins got home, he got a threatening letter asking him for $2,500. From the house detective? That's right, and he decided to pay. He was instructed to leave the money behind a statue in the park on 7th Street. Well, how did we happen to find out all about this, Jim? Rollins ran into one of the men who was out with him that night, a Harry Sheridan. They compared notes and found out that they'd each paid $2,500 to the same man and for stealing the same ring. Have you been able to get any list of the alumni who attended the class reunion? Yeah, Yeah, I've got it right here. Good. I also checked with the Central Hotel in Madison, Missouri, and as you've probably already guessed, the extortioner wasn't really the house detective. I didn't think so. Let's split this sheet of names in half, Keith, and start making some phone calls. Wilbur. Yes, Mother? Something bothering you, dear? Well... Is it something in one of those letters they sent up from the desk? Mother, I'm trying to remember something. Well, maybe I can help you, dear. You're right about my being bothered, and it is by one of those letters. Yeah, I knew it. The person who wrote it to me wants $5,000. What? From you? Yes. Why, that's shocking. Well, it's blackmail, Mother. The letter states, I know all about the diamond ring you stole at the Hotel Central in Madison, Missouri. Who signed the letter, Wilbur? There's no signature. I bet I know who sent it to you. Who? That man we've been playing croquet with, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks? You had the other letter in your coat pocket, and your coat was hanging over a chair when we were playing. But he was with us all the time. Well, his wife was sitting in that chair. She must have taken the letter out and read it. Why, that that's terrible, Mother. What do we do about it? Well... Well, I'm afraid the only thing we can do is answer the letter, dear. Sit down, Wilbur. We'll write him a reply. Is that you, Bill? Baby, call the man and order that mink. You got an answer. It was under the shrubs out back, just like I ordered it. And he's going to pay? Five G's. Oh, wonderful. (laughs) Could any of your other husbands have figured it out this fast? hmm? Oh, none of them. That's why I've stayed married to you for two whole years. (laughs) (laughs) Honey, what's the next move? I've got to contact him in a little while. What for? I'll tell him where to leave the moo. Oh, where will that be? Well, I haven't decided yet. 
How about that lifeguard's platform down at the beach? There won't be anybody close to that once it gets dark. Hmm, that'll be okay. I'll contact him right now. Keith, how'd you make out on your half of the Class 28? I haven't gotten anything so far. I just found another victim. The same racket? That's right. A man named Albie Scott. How long ago did he get his letter? A week ago, and he paid off on Tuesday night. Could he give any description of this winner? No. No, apparently all of the victims had such hangovers the morning of the shakedown, they didn't pay much attention. And that's the only time any of them ever saw the extortioner. After that first call, he conducted his business by mail and by phone. How about the letter that was written to Scott? Has he still got it? No, he burned it the way the others did. Yeah, I guess it's a little too much to expect any of them would keep that kind of letter on file. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, where do we go from here? Well, I've been thinking about that. I I think I may have an angle on this case. We can use one. Rollins and Sheridan, victims one and two, were out partying together while they were at that reunion. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I asked Scott who he'd been out with. He said that he and an old chum spent most of their time together. Hey... I think I see what you mean. And said old chum might be number four on their list. That's right. Did Scott have his address? He did, and I called, but they said he'd gone to Crestview Harbor. I called there. They said he was away on a fishing trip, but I think he just didn't want to answer the phone. Why? Well, maybe he's gotten his letter and doesn't want the law stepping in and giving him any publicity. You might be right. I just spoke to the boss about it. He gave us an okay to go out there. If our man is on a fishing trip, he probably won't be gone too long. When do we leave? Well, we catch the plane within an hour. Come here. Oh, how'd you do, honey? I'm a hero. That's what I am. Get a load of this green stuff. Here. Peek through here. Oh, hey, you didn't open the package down at the beach. I just wanted to make sure they didn't fill this with old newspaper clippings. Oh, honey. Lay it out on the floor. The money? Yeah. I want to run barefoot over it. Who is it? It's me, Mr. Brooks. Wilbur. Oh. Mother's with me. Are you ready for dinner? We had a date, you know. What'll we do? You think they suspect anything? No. How could they? I'll put the money away. You let him in. Okay. Well, good evening, good evening. Good evening. Come right in. Go right ahead, Mother. Thank you. Well, where's your wife, Mr. Brooks? Oh, she's in the bedroom. She's uh, dressing for dinner. Oh? Uh, Marge, the wheelers are here. Just a minute. I missed our croquet game today. Well, I had some business to attend to this afternoon. Oh. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right. We're really not very hungry. Shall we have a drink first? I think we should discuss something first. What's that? The $5,000 you collected this afternoon. What? Uh, My mother is referring to the money that was left for you on the beach. Why, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no point in covering, Bill. Obviously, they know you wrote the letter. We not only know he wrote the letter, we want the money. You mean you're reneging? You want us to expose your son as a thief? My son isn't a thief, Mrs. Brooks. You see, we never paid that money. What? Uh, uh, That letter you took out of my coat, Mrs. Brooks, wasn't sent to me. What do you mean? Uh, That was a letter Mother had written for me to mail to a a contributor we have here in Crestview Harbor. Wait a minute. You mean you were shaking somebody down? That's right, young man. Well, you stupid... But you've been very helpful to us. We were able to send him your letter instead of taking the risk of sending ours. You what? And you also spared us the rather dangerous task of picking up the package of money. Why, you... Now, please, let us have the 5000 Oh, no. Even when I back up my request with this? Uh, she has a gun. I think I should caution you both... She's quite expert with it. Thank you, Wilbur. (laughs) Now, where's the money? Well, answer me. What'd you do with it, Marge? In the bedroom, under the bed. Wilbur, go fetch it, please. Yes, Mother. And look around while you're in there. See if you see anything that might be of sentimental value. I will, Mother. This is a great little idea you had. Oh, lay off. You have a perfect right to criticize him, young lady. He handled this whole affair rather clumsily. Look, you keep out of this. Young man, I'm just saying this for your own good. I hate to criticize, but you really haven't any talent for this business at all. Listen, I... have the money, Mother. That's fine. I also found some jewelry that belonged to them. Good boy. My jewelry. Now take those curtain sashes, tie the people up, put them in the closet, and we can have our dinner. (laughs) 
We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. A few weeks from now, on scores of elm-shaded campuses, the bells of our colleges will call the sons and daughters of America to the most valuable experience of their lives. I say valuable experience advisedly. Did you know that the average college graduate earned $72,000 more during his working years than the average American? $72,000 more than the men who don't go to college. Well, that's a lot of money. You're right, Stan, it is. There's a close tie-up between earning and learning. And that's why a father who really has his heart in his children's future doesn't leave their education to chance. He makes sure that they'll go to college. He makes sure with an equitable education fund. Well, I've got a little savings account for my boy's education. An equitable education fund goes a lot farther than that, Stan. It's a complete plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And it gives you these three advantages. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, say, that sounds good. Whom do I see about it? A representative of the Equitable Society? Right, Stan. Get in touch with an equitable man soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, from the moment you sign for an educational fund with the Equitable Life Assurance Society, you can be sure that when the college bells ring in 1960 or 1965, your boy or girl will hear them and will be ready to answer the call. Now back to tonight's file, The Wrong Way Shakedown. There are no available figures on the money that was garnered in the past 12 months from your fellow Americans by those vicious criminals who practice blackmail. That statement will always be true because the statistics are impossible to gather without the cooperation of those who have been victimized. By the very nature of the crime, though, if the extortion victims were willing to report their payments to the police, they would have gone to the police in the first place. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, one criminal attempted extortion from another, but that does not mean that you, as a law-abiding citizen, may not be the next victim. If that should happen to you, there is only one thing for you to do. Go to your telephone, call the operator, tell her, please get me the police. Tonight's file continues in the closet of the hotel room occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. They've been battering at the door since Wilbur and Mrs. Wheeler left them there. Oh, this is great. We get ourselves untied and we still can't get out. Don't come to me with your troubles. Ah, you're a big help. I didn't think geniuses needed any help. How did I know they were larceny bums? Because you're the smartest husband I ever had, remember? Yeah, I wish I was the smartest ex-husband you ever had. I got half your action. Oh, shut up. I'm going to try this door again. Ah, it's giving a little. I never thought I'd grow old in a closet. Oh, don't worry. We'll get out of here. You better find those two when we do. I want my jewelry back. Oh, you keep talking like this was all my fault. Like I found the letter in Wilbur's coat. Oh, now I shouldn't have found the letter. Oh. Uh, that does it. Now let's call the desk and see if they're gone. Oh, sure, they're gone. You think they're waiting for us? Go down to the lobby and see if you can find out where they went. Okay. And don't come back until you do. Keith, our guest was right. You mean you found the fourth victim? Uh huh. His name is John Mason. He was at home when I got there, and he said he refused our call because he didn't want the publicity. Oh, then he's gotten a letter too. Not only gotten a letter, but paid, and they tapped him for five thousand instead of the usual twenty-five hundred. Well, I guess they thought he could stand it a little better. He wants us to drop the case, forget all about it. Oh, sure, and let whoever did it go right on blackmailing somebody else. Hey, we got one break with Mason, though. At least he still had the letter. Did he give it to you? Mm-hmm. Here it is. Take a look at it. 
Hey, that's a pretty distinctive handwriting. Yeah, that's why I think it might be a break. If this person never wrote anything else we have on file, the lab ought to be able to find it pretty quickly. You want me to send it through? Yeah, will you, Keith? Sure. Uh, before you do, have a photostat made so we can use it around here. Use it for what, Jim? Well, I thought we'd check the hotel registers here in Crestview Harbor, see if anybody's handwriting checks for that. Good idea. I'll have the photostat back as soon as I can. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm going to check the hotels. <laughs> Marge, they did check out. Naturally. But nobody knows where they went. Did you try the transportation desk? Uh Uh-huh. He had a telegram in his pocket when I went through it. I'm trying to remember where it was from. What kind of a telegram? It was from a hotel confirming a reservation. Well, think of it, girl. Think of it. I've been trying. (sighs) Look, maybe this will help you. Was the hotel in Chicago? No. New York? No. San Francisco? I've got it. It was San Francisco? No, but it was the San Carlos Hotel. What city? That I don't know. Oh. Wait a minute. There's a book downstairs with the names of every hotel in the country. I'm going to get it, and we'll just call every San Carlos Hotel we find until we come to the right one. Special Agent Johnson. Hello, Keith. Jim, I'm over at the Harbor Inn. I found that same handwriting on the register. You couldn't miss it. The lab found out who it was, too. It's Bill Bentley. It's what? That's right, Jim, the check passer. Well, he's registered here as Bill Brooks. Oh, that's an old alias of his. Oh. Well, he's never mixed up in anything except bad checks, to the best of my knowledge. Well, that's all he's ever been arrested for. Oh. You know, this case gets tougher instead of easier as we go along. Yeah. Does anybody know where Brooks went when he checked out? No, but his room hasn't been cleared out yet, and the manager's going to let me go through it. You want me help? Yeah, pick up a warrant for Brooks and his wife. Okay. And Keith, just in case they were working with anyone else, pick up a John Doe warrant, too. Will do. I'll see you over here as soon as you can make it. Mother? Hmm? Oh, yes, son? Oh, I- I'm sorry. Were you sleeping? No. No, I've just been sitting here reminiscing. Do you know this was the first town your father was arrested in? Really? Yes. And I'm sorry to say it was because he didn't perform his routine properly. Oh. That's why it's important, Wilbur, to always keep practicing. Keep going over and over the job that you're to do. It does get tiresome, Mother. I know, but it saves trouble. Now... Now, let's hear you go through your performance once more. Oh, Mother. Oh, come on, now. Oh, oh, very well. I, I knock on the door. And when the party opens it, I walk in and say, uh, Mr. Jones, I'm the house detective here. Oh, more firmly, Wilbur. Uh, yes, Mother. <clears throat> I'm the house detective here. There's been a serious charge made against you. That's better. Uh, The party in the next room claims he saw you walk in there last night. Mm -hmm. There's a very valuable ring missing from that room. I'm afraid I'm going to have to search your room. Fine, son. Now describe what you do. Well, I I search the room. Mm -hmm. Then I palm the ring and find it in the gentleman's suit. Correct. Well, one thing, Mother. I do have trouble palming the ring. Oh, but that's why you have to keep practicing. That's what your father did. He eventually became so proficient he could palm a trunk. Mother, I've always meant to ask you, is this ring the same one that Dad used? Yes, son, it is. I'd venture to say that ring has been to more class reunions than the Dean of Harvard. I got those warrants, Jim. Oh, good. Find anything up in Brooks' room? No, but I did find out there's a Wilbur and Mrs. Wheeler mixed up in this somewhere. Where do they fit in? I don't know that yet. But when I didn't find anything in Brooks' room, I found out that Brooks had been looking frantically for either of the Wheelers. Were they staying here, too? Yeah, they checked out a little while before the Brooks did. I went up to Mrs. Wheeler's room, and in the wastebasket, I found the paper that Mr. Mason had used to wrap the extortion money in. Well, that sure ties them in, Jim. Yeah. And now I wish we could find out how. No lead on where the Wheelers went, either, is there? No, neither couple left any forwarding address. Well, they're probably not traveling together. Brooks was around looking for Wheeler. No. No, but I'm not so sure that if we can find one, we won't find the other pretty close. What do you think we ought to do first? Well, the switchboard here is getting up all the telephone slips on every call that Brooks and Wheeler made. Let's go back there and see if we can get anything out of them. 
Uh, yes, Mother. Someone at the door, dear. Would you see who it is, dear? Probably the tailor bringing back my suit. Well, it's nice to find you home. Uh, Step back and let a lady in. Uh, Mother, it's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. Well, well, imagine that. Well, you know what we came for. And this time I've got the gun. Oh, so I see. Come on, just lay that money you took in my damp little fist. And don't forget my jewelry. Oh, but... But we haven't got it. No, ain't that a shame? But it's true. Well, what happened? Did a big bad man come and take your money away? No. We deposited it in the bank. We always keep our money there. Oh, you do? Why, certainly. You've got to be very careful these days. There's so many dishonest people around. Tell whoever that is to go away. But it's the tailor with my suit. Okay. Open the door a little bit and take the suit. But if you make any crack about what's going on, I'll shoot your mother so fast you'll never hear her hit the floor. Oh, I won't say it. anything. You won't have to hear her say anything. Drop that gun, Mrs. Brooks. What? Drop it! Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've made a long trip to get all four of you. Oh, you don't want us, officer. It's them. Oh, no, Mrs. Wheeler. We want you and your son, too. Now, come on. All of you. Mrs. Wheeler, her son Wilbur Wheeler, and William and Marjorie Brooks were tried, convicted, and sentenced to five years in prison on charges of extortion. The telephone slips which the two special agents examined at the Harbor Inn switchboard revealed that Bill Brooks had telephoned the San Carlos Hotel in eight different cities and that at the last one he had located Wilbur and Mrs. Wheeler. From that point on, it was just a matter of getting to the hotel in time to apprehend the four of them. And thus, your FBI aided in the conviction of another group of criminals. Aided in their convictions, but did not obtain those sentences because that is not the work of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI apprehends criminals, but the job of convicting them belongs to another branch of the Department of Justice. That procedure is followed out because of the fact that no one, least of all the members of the Bureau, wants your FBI to be anything but a fact-finding agency an agency which has won the reputation of living up to the words which form their motto, F for fidelity, B for bravery, and I for integrity. FBI, fidelity, bravery, integrity. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now one final question on the Equitable Education Fund. Mr. Keating, my boy has just celebrated his first birthday. Is that too young to start one of those plans for him? On the contrary. The sooner you start, the lower the yearly cost will be. Well, why is that? Because you have more years over which to spread the total amount required to send your boy to college. So why not get in touch with your Equitable Society representative? Look him up soon. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case concerning the curious trail of stolen jewelry that led across three states. Its subject, interstate theft. Its title, The Telltale Bracelet. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Telltale Bracelet on This Is Your FBI.
This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an equitable education fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Telltale Bracelet. The summer vacation period is drawing to a close. And throughout the nation, businessmen are getting ready for the fall season. Americans earn their daily bread in an endless variety of ways. And in almost every one of those pursuits, there is a seasonal fluctuation. But there is at least one business in the United States which does not depend for its revenue on any such variable circumstances as the weather. That business is crime. Criminals are reaping a tremendous harvest in this country. To tell you one figure out of the welter gathered by your FBI will not tell you the whole story, but it may give you some idea of the magnitude of criminal operations in the United States in the past 12 months. In that time, criminals stole property valued at a total of more than $113 million, or almost $10 million a month. Of that amount, more than $9 million represented the value of stolen jewelry, a sum which puts jewel theft into the category of big business. This would be a somber report if the theft of jewels was diminishing. The shocking fact is that it is rising and the end is nowhere in sight. Tonight's file opens in a small neighborhood theater in a Connecticut city. It is early afternoon. In a shabby dressing room of this playhouse, Jay and Ruth Brooks, a comedy team, are making up for the first of their daily performances. Ruth? Yeah? Did I tell you what I told the manager about this dressing room? No. I walked right up to him and I said, Piermont, who's got top billing on this bill? He says, you and your wife have. So I said, well, I'm glad you recognize that by having our dressing room fixed. And he says, what do you mean fixed? I says, you put a fresh coat of dirt on the walls. <laughs> well, come on, kid, laugh it up. What's the matter? That joke is too true. This is such a crumby place. Oh, Ruthie, we needed a day to break in the new routines. Besides, we're getting top billing, ain't we? That all helps with what I got in mind. Oh, what's that? That story I showed you in Variety about television. You know, how they need class acts like ours? Is that what it says in Variety? Sure. They figure it just like I do. They figure that television has got to have a beautiful Jay. name and a... What? Listen. That's the music for the three balls of fire. That means they're on. I thought you spoke to the manager about them. I did. I said to him, Piermont, how can you expect us to get any last following the strip tease act? What'd he say? Well, what could he say? We're the headliners, ain't we? Top billing? Why are we still following them? Well, look, Piermont couldn't re-routine the bill on such short notice. But after this first show, he'll put them on behind us. Why couldn't he do oh, it now? Oh, honey, forget it, will you? We got important things to think about. There may be television scouts out front. Oh. Well, how 
how do I look? Sensational. Like the bracelet? Where'd you get it? I borrowed it from Edna. Well, that's kind of junky. But leave it on. Come on. Let's get out on stage. You think there'll really be television scouts out there? Sure. Oh, I hope I remember the new routine. Well, what if you don't? Remember me? <laughs> Ad-lib Sam. Oh, but I'm not oh, as good as... stop worrying. Come on, let's go down now and murder the people. Edna. Edna. That you, Tommy? Yeah. Be right with you. Uh, look, honey, I, I can't stay long. I thought we were going out. Well, we were, but uh, something's happened. Uh, look, come here, will you? What is it? What's the matter? Edna, uh, first of all, I want you to know I ain't an Indian giver. When I give somebody a present, it's a present for them to keep. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But um, something's come up on that last stuff I gave you. Oh, you mean the bracelet? Yeah, and the two rings. Well? Well, to tell you the truth, Edna, that, that stuff didn't belong to me. I, I, I borrowed it. You borrow junk like that? That ain't junk. The bracelet and those two rings happen to be worth about 12 Gs. Are you kidding? No. Who'd you borrow it from? Eddie Marshall. The racket guy? Yeah. Oh, why'd he lend it to you? Well, he didn't actually lend it. He, uh, he gave it to me to hold for him when he got picked up by the cops. Huh? So you play the big guy and give it to me. Well, Edna, at the time, I figured you could keep it. Why? Well, Marshall figured to be convicted and get ten years. Somehow he beat the rap. Now he's loose and I got word he wants to see me. So be a good kid and let me have it back, huh? I haven't got it. What? Not here. Well, where is it? I loaned it to a friend of mine. Oh. Ruth Brooks. Uh, the little vaudeville dame? Yeah. Well, go and get it right back. I can't. Why not? Jack went out of town. Where? I don't know. Oh, fine. Look, now this Marshall's a real bad guy. Well, why didn't you think of that when you gave me the present? Oh, stop, will you? We've got to find this Brooks dame and find her fast. I have to get that stuff back tonight. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approached by Agent Leo Schuyler. Oh, Jim, that's probably the message hmm? I left for you. Oh, hi, Leo. I just missed you when you went out for lunch. I went out a little early, Leo. I wanted to stop by police headquarters. On the Madison case? No, the supervisor got a call this morning from one of the detectives down at headquarters about some stolen jewelry. Well, that's the case I've been assigned to work on with you. Oh, good. Uh, can you fill me in on the background? Well, I don't know too much about it myself yet, but I'll give you everything we've got. Okay. A woman named Mrs. Jenkins in Philadelphia had some jewelry stolen a couple of months ago. Uh-huh. She used to live in New York, and she still reads the New York papers pretty regularly. One of the papers had a picture of a society girl and a boyfriend dancing at one of the local nightclubs. Yes? Well, behind them in the picture is another couple. The girl's back is to the camera, so we don't know who she is. But on her wrist is a bracelet that was stolen from Mrs. Jenkins. Well, how does she know it's hers, Jeff? Because it was designed exclusively for her, and it's supposed to be the only one of its kind. I see. The face of the man, the one who's dancing with the girl, is very distinguishable. Well, maybe somebody around the nightclub knows who he is. Well, I called the nightclub press agent. He came into the office. He's there every night, and he said he'd never seen the man before. Hmm. Well, maybe one of the waiters knows him. Yeah, it's possible. I'm having a couple of the prints of the picture blown up. Will you take one of them over to the club, Leo? Check with the waiters and the captains? Sure. I'll stay here and go over the files. I want to see if they can tell us the identity of the man in the picture. Me, me, me. <coughs> me, da, ha, 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 me, ha. Uh, who's there? Me, who else? Oh, <laughs> I thought maybe it was Piermont, the manager. Figured he might be coming back to apologize. For what? Oh, for the run-in I had with him. Where you been all this time? There was a phone call for me out in the box office. You knew that's where I went. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who was it? It was Edna Gilmer. She was calling long distance from New York. Well, what did she want? It was about that bracelet and those rings she loaned me. She wants them back. She's sending her boyfriend, Tommy, up here for them tonight. Well, why all the hurry? She said her boyfriend, Tommy, was mad at her because she wasn't wearing the stuff. Uh, why don't he stop trying to be Humphrey Bogart? Jay, why'd you have a run-in with Mr. Piermont? Oh, uh, it was about making us follow them three balls of fire. Wouldn't he change us? Uh, not at first. What do you mean? Well, he tried to wiggle out of it. He had some phony excuse about us not getting enough laughs the first show. 
We didn't get many. Well, that's because there wasn't many customers. That's what I told the guy. I said, you get us some customers, we'll get you the laughs. You notice how the musicians went for us, don't you? They were screaming. There were only three of them. Well, who cares how many? Those Petrilla guys are help. Oh, brother, and they're plenty hep, too. They love this smart material. Look, how many times do I have to tell you, honey? This is a class act. We're building it for television, not the yokels in this town. Now, come on, hurry up and change. We're on in ten minutes. Oh, Jim. Yes, Leo? I went to that nightclub. No one could identify the man in the picture. Oh, I called you at the club, but you'd already left. We found out who he is. Oh, good. His picture turned up in the files. He's a petty larceny thief named Tom Wells. Oh, he shouldn't be too tough to find. Oh, not if he's still in town. He may have gone under, though, when the picture appeared in the paper. That's true. In any event, we've sent out a new alarm on him. Oh, here I... I'll get his record here. Have you had a chance to study it? Yeah. You know, and I can't see how he could have been mixed up in the jewel robbery. Well, you said he was a thief, didn't you? Yes, but he's never been arrested for stealing jewelry. I, I think this Jenkins job is a little out of his league. Why? Well, three of his arrests have been for booking policy numbers. And all the rest here are for peddling punch boards to high school kids. But there's no denying that the bracelet in this picture is the one that was stolen from Mrs. Jenkins. Oh, no, it's true enough. A jeweler who made the bracelet for Mrs. Jenkins positively identified it. Uh, Jim, I assume the police have already checked on the address Wells gave them when he was last arrested. Oh, yeah. yeah, they have. It's a roaming house, and Wells did not return there after he served his time. The only thing to do now, Leo, is hope we get an answer on that alarm. Oh, Jay. Why? I just can't seem to get this break right. Well, you better not fool around with it anymore now, honey. We're on in a few minutes. On again so soon? Uh Uh-huh. We were just off an hour ago. How many shows are we doing here a day? Six. Six? Well, we get a break because we're headliners. The other acts are doing seven. That's on weekdays. Of course, on Sundays you can't tell. Jay. Huh? Do you hear that? Uh, Yeah. That's the music for them striptease dames. Thought we were supposed to be on ahead of them. Yeah, that's what that Piermont told me. How do you like that guy? No wonder Vaudeville is dead. That's probably him with another bum excuse. Yeah. Come in. Ruth Brooks in here. Oh, hi, Edna. Oh, come in. Thanks. Oh, Jay, you remember Edna. Yeah, sure. Hi. I'd ask you to sit down, Edna, except there ain't another chair. If we had another chair, where'd we put it? On my shoulders? Oh, no, Jay. Uh, I'm fed up with the way we're being treated around here. Gee, I didn't expect you, Edna. I thought your boyfriend was coming to see us. I decided to come myself. How'd you know where we were playing? Called up your agent. Look, have you got the bracelet and the rings? Oh, yeah, sure. Could I have them, honey? Oh, they're not here. Huh? I went back to the hotel after the last show. I left them there. Oh, well, let's go over and get them. Okay, right after this show. Look, I haven't got time to wait. Let's go now. She can't go now, Edna. We're almost on. She's got to. I can't wait. Why not? I, uh, well, if you must know, that bracelet and those rings are real. What? Yeah. Yeah, they're worth 12000 Oh, my. I got to get them in a hurry. Does Tommy want them back? He isn't interested in them anymore. Tommy was killed this afternoon. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Soon, from hundreds of well-loved college halls, the bells will ring out to welcome nearly two and a half million young Americans. But what about the boys and girls who are forced by fate to turn a deaf ear to the college bells? Many of them with excellent records in high school. Youngsters well qualified for college, but who for one reason or another won't get the chance. Believe me, Mr. Keating, they're never going to say that of my boy. I've made certain that he'll have the money to go, regardless of what happens to me. After hearing you talk about an equitable education fund last week, I got in touch with my equitable society representative and signed up. Fine, Norman. You'll never regret that move, and neither will that boy of yours. 
For members of this audience who didn't hear this program last week, I'll repeat some of the advantages of an equitable education fund as offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's what sold me, Mr. Keating. That's why I decided to see my Equitable Society representative. And I earnestly urge every forethoughtful father or mother to do likewise, or to send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, once you set up an Equitable Education Fund, you can be sure that when the college bells are ringing for the class of 1958 or 65, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to tonight's file, The Telltale Bracelet. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI gives ample illustration of the basic inherent difference between the criminal and the decent citizen. The decent citizen, upon finding himself in possession of something that does not rightfully belong to him, makes every attempt to see that the property is returned to its owner. The criminal, on the other hand, has no such impulse. The decent citizen is one who recognizes the temptation of easy gain for what it is and has the strength to resist. The criminal likewise recognizes the temptation and succumbs because the emotion which rules his every move is greed. To the criminal, getting something for nothing is the only important thing, for it is the keystone upon which his entire world is built. What his consuming greed and his overpowering egomania prevent the criminal from knowing is that getting something for nothing is an impossibility and that you always pay for what you get. Another thing the criminal never learns until too late is that the price to him is always high, often his very life. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Jim. Oh, Jim. Yes, Leo. <laughs> I just about given up on you. Oh, I'm sorry, Leo. I should have called. I've been down at the morgue. On what? A police reported a killing this afternoon. It turned out to be our missing suspect, Tommy Wells. Oh. What happened? Well, the coroner said Wells had been beaten to death at his hotel with a blunt instrument. Possibly the butt of a gun. Any leads? No. No, nothing so far. Well, it's not going to be easy to find out who that girl in the picture was now. Oh, I think I know her. Really? Yeah, there were three pictures of the same girl in Wells' room at the hotel. In every one of the pictures, she's wearing her hair in an upsweep. That's the way the girl in the newspaper picture was wearing her hair, too. Yeah, I know. I checked around the hotel, and the bell captain told me this was the only girl he ever saw Wells with. Did he know who the girl is? No, but the pictures were all made by the black and white studios. I took them down there, and they identified the girl as Edna Gilmer. Oh. Did they know where Miss Gilmer lives? Yes, they gave me her address, but when I checked, I found out she'd left town. She's gone to Hartford, Connecticut, according to her landlady. Well, Jim, we know her name, and we know what she looks like. I don't think we'll have too much trouble finding her. I hope not. I've already notified the police up there to be on the lookout for her. What do we do now, Jim? As soon as we get an okay, we go to Hartford. <laughs> Edna, did I hear you right? Did you say that Tommy was killed? Yeah. How? He was beaten to death. By who? I think it was a man named Eddie Marshall. Well, who's he? A racket guy. Why did he kill Tommy? On account of the jewelry. Why? It belonged to Marshall. Tommy had no right to give it to me. Oh. Are the police looking for Marshall? I don't know. Well, didn't you tell him about him? No. Why not? That's their business. Oh, but Edna... Look, we're wasting time. Let's go to the hotel and get the bracelet and rings. Oh, we told you, Edna, we're due on stage. Edna, what do you plan to do with the stuff when you get it? Turn it over to the police? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, then what's the hurry? I... Uh, look, I might as well tell you something. Eddie Marshall is smart to the fact that I know where the jewelry is. So? There's also a very good chance that he followed me up here to Hartford. 
You mean followed you here to us? Yes. When he finds out that you've got the stuff, you're in it too. Oh. So if you want to be in the clear, let's get over to your hotel. You're on. We're on, he said. Yeah. What'll we do? We do with the act. Now, wait a minute. We've got to, Edna. Come on, Ruth. We'll sure get a lot of laughs this show. Stop the music. What's the matter now? A very funny thing happened to me tonight while I was on my way to the theater. It did? What's that? Ran into an old friend of mine. He said to me, Jay, I have never been so happy in my life. My wife's an angel. And what did you say to him? I said, you're lucky. <laughs> Mine's still alive. Stop the music. Uh, what did you do that for? I wanted to tell you something. I got a letter from my mother. She said there's only one way to make sure of having your husband home on Sunday. How? Shoot him Saturday night. Yuck, 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 yuck. What a dog that was. Should we take a bow? Yeah, we'd better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, brother, I'm glad that one's over. What do we do now, Jay? About what? That gangster. Oh, honey, don't worry about him. But Edna said he probably followed her here. Oh, she's just guessing about him. Come on, let's go to the dressing room. She might be guessing right, Jay. Look. Tell you what we'll do. We go back to the hotel, get the jewelry, then take Edna down to the police station and explain the whole thing. Suppose Edna's gone. Then we'll take the jewelry down to the police ourselves. Go ahead, honey. Okay. Well, Edna, I got the whole thing figured out. We go to the hotel, get the jewelry, then we go to the police station. You ain't huh? going no place. Edna, who's he? That's Eddie Marshall. <laughs> Leo, Leo, over here. All right, Jim. Oh, brother, I'm tired. Any luck, Leo? I'm afraid not, Jim. What did you cover? Just about all of Hartford. No. I checked the railroad station, bus depots, cab drivers. Yeah, how about the airport? No luck there, either. You know, she probably drove up here. Uh, how did you make out of the hotel check? I didn't do any better than you did. This hotel was the last one on our list. Mm. What do we do now, Jim? Well, let's reconstruct this thing, huh? Okay. I think it's safe to assume that she was coming here to Hartford for a specific reason, to see someone. Yes. Now, she's not staying at a hotel, so it's probable that her visit here is going to be a short one. Which makes it that much harder. There are about 200,000 people in Hartford, Jim. And she did come to visit someone, we have a pretty wide choice. Now, but the field is narrower than that. Don't forget her landlady did tell us she came up here to see someone named Brooks. We've called every Brooks in the phone book. Yeah. yeah. You know, if we only knew her motive for coming here... Leo... Why should an out-of-work chorus girl who comes from Council Bluffs, Iowa, suddenly leave New York for Hartford, Connecticut, and then disappear? Mm. Well, Jim, if we could... Hey, don't... hey, wait a minute. What? I know one angle we haven't explored. Come on. Where are you going? Over to the newsstand. We're buying a Hartford paper. So, this is Mr. Marshall. That's right. Well, uh, pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Marshall. Uh, you ever have any relatives in Vaudeville? Used to be an act called... I Michael ain't Kirk interested. And... Look, Mr. Marshall, this dressing room's kind of small. And we got to change and I all... just want one thing. What's that? Jewelry. A bracelet and two rings. Well, we don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Marshall. He knows you got him. Oh. Where are they? They're over at the hotel. All right, let's go over there. Oh, we, we can't go like this. Why not? With his zoot coat and these funny shoes? <laughs> Gee, I, I don't want people laughing at me. Nobody will laugh at you, brother. 
I know. I just seen you right. What do you mean by that? Look, I got a gun here. I don't care what you got. Were you panning the axe? Mac, I'm warning you. Jay Doozy says. Honey, he's knocking the axe. He's going to use the gun, Jay. No, he isn't. Ah. Let it fall, Marshal. Go on. Drop it, I said. Uh. Well, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. <gasps> we were looking for Miss Gilmer here. Her landlady told us that she'd come to Hartford to see a Mrs. Brooks. You were difficult to locate until we figured that because she's in show business, she might be visiting somebody in a theater here. So we bought the local paper and looked at the amusement page to see what was playing. And you saw our names. That's right, in the ad for this theater. You see, Ruth? That's what I've been telling you. That's how important top billing is. Eddie Marshall was turned over to local authorities, prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to be executed for the murder of Tom Wells. And thus, your FBI closed another case. Closed another case and thereby solved two crimes. The Philadelphia jewel theft and the murder of Tom Wells. It is not an uncommon occurrence for the special agents of your FBI to solve more than one crime with one arrest. Because it is an axiom among law enforcement officers that one crime invariably leads to another. Sometimes those early crimes are minor. But however trivial they may appear to be, and however far from you they may occur... They affect you directly. They affect you because the commission of every crime is an attack against law and order. And should those attacks ever prove to be overwhelming, it would mean an end to your personal liberties and to every shred of your security. That is why the battle against crime, a battle which your FBI fights 24 hours a day, is your battle too. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now I have just 25 seconds to answer one last question on the Equitable Education Fund. Mr. Keating, suppose I start one of those funds for my daughter. Then, when she gets to be 18, she gets married instead of going to college. What happens then? Well, that's strictly up to you. The money is yours. You can use it to pay for your daughter's trousseau and wedding or for any purpose you see fit. So, no matter what happens, it's a good idea to see your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The exciting account of a relentless search for an international killer. Its subject, impersonation. Its title... The Great Deception. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Great Deception on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together 
to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming equitable society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted equitable society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an equitable education fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Great Deception. That there is an unprecedented crime wave engulfing the nation at the present time is an indisputable fact. The reasons for that crime wave are many and varied, and the ripples of that wave touch your daily life wherever you live or wherever you work. Some years ago, when we were fighting a war for our survival, we seemed to understand that if there existed anywhere in the world any brand of tyranny, if in one isolated spot the freedom of human beings was threatened, then ours, too, was likewise threatened. That was an accepted fact, because the truth of it was proven. It is an equally solid fact that any crime anywhere in the world affects you. It affects not only your daily life, but it also affects the nation. For it is written in stone on the facade of the building which houses the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington, D.C., that no free government can survive that is not based on the supremacy of the law. And if the day should ever come when crimes can be committed with impunity, then the freedom of the nation, your freedom, will be gone forever. Tonight's file opens in the living room of a nicely furnished home located in the suburb of a large eastern city. It is mid-afternoon. One of the occupants of this dwelling, Mrs. Peter Clayton, is arranging flowers in a vase as the front door opens. Elizabeth! Peter! Hello, my oh, dear. Oh, Peter, darling. Oh, darling. Oh, my, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy to have you home. I looked for you at the airport. Oh, I was furious about that. I didn't get your wire until ten minutes ago. Well, I sent it when we landed at Newfoundland. Newfoundland? Well, I certainly should have gotten it. You know, I have a good mind to call those people. Oh, forget it, darling. Oh. Don't you want to hear about the trip? Oh, of course. How is Paris? Well, I'm too tired to go into all of the details now, but I'm afraid the trip was a failure. Well, what do you mean? What happened? It's a long story. Come on upstairs. I'll tell you about it. All right, dear. Well, at least the trip was successful in one way. You did put on some weight. What makes you say that? Oh, that suit you're wearing. It's tight on you. I bought this suit in New York at one o'clock. Today? Uh-huh. But why? Why did you need another suit? Well, I couldn't very well come out here in an army uniform. Oh, Peter, what are you talking about? What were you doing with an army uniform? I wore it to get out of France. But where did you get it? Off the body of a soldier I killed. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bob Hudson. You very busy, Bob? No, Jim. I just got to read this report on the Lester case. Why, right, what's up? Oh, I was in to see the SAC. He wants us to work together on something that's just come in. Hmm, fine. What kind of a case is it? Ah, uh, we're not sure. I'd better give you this thing the way the SAC gave it to me, huh? Okay, Jim, shoot. An unidentified man was found dead in a garage in Paris. Paris, France? That's right. From his clothes, the Paris police were able to guess that he was an American. All of the clothes were from stores in this country. I see. The Paris newspapers ran a picture of this unidentified dead American in the hope that somebody might be able to let them know who he was. Mm -hmm. Well, the day the picture appeared in the papers, a major in the United States Army recognized the person, identified him as a deserter. Well, how do we get in on this, Jim? Oh, I'll come to that, Bob. The Army airmailed the fingerprints of the dead man to Signal Corps headquarters in Washington. They sent the prince over to IDENT to confirm the major's identification. Well, now, let me see if I understand all the facts so far. Okay. A man is found dead in a Paris garage, mm. and we have identified the prince as belonging to an army deserter. That's right. 
Now, what's the rest of the story? Well, the Paris police, in checking every possible lead, came across something that puzzled them. The dead American's name was George A. Perry. His uh, army serial number was... Uh, uh, 12060514. Well, the Paris police found that a sergeant, George A. Perry, with that same serial number, returned to this country on an army plane from Paris yesterday. Well, well how could that happen? Well, that's what had them puzzled. They checked the army orders, which were on file at the airport in Paris. They found out they were counterfeit. Have we got a copy of those orders? Not yet, but we're getting a copy of them. Also, the uh, civilian clothes that were found on the dead soldier. Well, what do you make of this whole thing, Jim? Well, Bob, I think it's probable that whoever murdered Perry switched clothes with him, forged those orders, and then came home in Perry's uniform. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, technically, we're looking for this man, not for murder, but on a charge of illegal wearing of the uniform. That's right, Bob. Have we got any idea what this man we're looking for looks like? No, none yet. Well, what do you think we ought to do first, then, Jim? I've already called the airport here. I've got a list of the people who returned on that plane from Paris from them. How about addresses? They were all Army personnel, so locating them shouldn't be too difficult. At least a couple of them should remember what he looked like. Uh huh. Then we'll send the description down to Washington, let them check the general appearance file, and send us as many pictures as they have. Oh, that'll work if the killer's a known desperate criminal. That's right. Jim, when do you want to start checking the passengers on that plane? Right now, Bob. Here, let's split this list in half and start making some phone calls. <laughs> coffee, Peter? No, thank you, dear. You're not eating much breakfast. Well, it's so long since I've seen an American paper, I'd much rather read. Peter? Yes, dear? Can I consult you on a few engagements? <laughs> All right, dear. The Shelleys want us Thursday night for cocktails. Now, what'll I tell them? Tell them we'll be there. Oh, good. Now, the Flippins want us for dinner on Saturday. Well, I'm not too sure about that. I may be tied up Saturday. On the Paris business? No, darling. That book is closed. Oh, I hope that's true. What do you mean? I hope you're in the clear. Elizabeth, I've told you a dozen times. No one can possibly connect me with the killing. But you were that sergeant's partner, weren't you? Well, a very silent partner. But, Peter, when they investigate his death, they're bound to find out about his black market operation. Well, it still won't lead to me. Yes, but, Peter, you Look, said... I will have some more coffee now, dear. And as for dinner at the Flippins, tell them we accept. <laughs> Jim. Yes, Bob? We just received a report from the Paris police. Oh, what is it? Well, they conducted a further investigation on that army deserter's activities. Oh, what'd they find? Well, he was a pretty active figure in the black market. Oh. He was also believed to have a partner, a man who had come from America to superintend his operations. Sort of an efficiency expert? That's it. Paris police have any idea who that man might be? No. Uh, how have you been making out with the plane passengers? Well, I showed them all the pictures Washington sent to us out of the general appearance file. Any luck? Yes, three of the passengers all picked this picture here. Hmm. Yeah, they say this is the man who came back on the plane with them. Who is he? His name is Peter Caldwell. Well, we got a record on him? Yeah, but I don't know how much good it'll do us. Well, why not? Well, for one thing, Caldwell's arrest record doesn't show anything since 1939. In addition to that, we're not even sure what his name is. What do you mean, Jim? Well, he's been arrested under the names Calhoun, Carroll, Carlson, Crawford, Clinton, and Crenshaw. Oh, I see. So I think it's pretty obvious that he's using some name now other than Peter Caldwell. Mm -hmm. However, we can assume that he's here in town. Why? Well, here are his clothes. They were all bought here. Are those the clothes he put on the dead soldier? Yeah, they just arrived from Paris. Any identification? No, none on the suit, but... Here, Bob, take a look at these shoes. Oh. They're custom-made. Now, take a look at these marks inside the tongue here on the left shoe. Uh -huh. <laughs> they don't mean anything to me, Jim. Well, custom shoemakers, Bob, have their own method of marking shoes. So I think we'd better take these to one of the custom shoemakers here in town. Where do you want to start? Well, there's a bootmaker right down on the next block. I'm going over and see him. If he can tell us who made these shoes, we might find the murderer. <laughs> I didn't expect you'd still be home. I thought you were going to the office. I changed my mind. I phoned instead. Is something wrong? Yeah. What is it? I was informed I had a caller at my office. He was from the FBI. Oh. Talked to my secretary, asked questions. 
About Paris? Yes. Then they must suspect. That's right. And you were so sure they didn't know. Yes. What are you going to do, Peter? I'm just trying to think that out. It's a little difficult. Somehow you never realize a thing like this can happen to you. Have you spoken to your lawyer? Well, hardly. Well, why not? He would certainly Elizabeth, be... my lawyer knows me as a legitimate businessman. I don't think it'd be much help on a murder charge. Well, then who can you turn to? No one. Oh, but darling, that means everything we've built up for nine years. Our friends, our home, our respectability. They're all gone. That's right, dear. Oh, I'm afraid there's only one solution. Peter, what do you mean? You know what I mean. There's only one way out. And I'm going to take it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Very soon now, millions of eager young Americans will answer the summons of the college bells, ringing in a new academic year, years that most men consider the happiest of their lives. But college years are not only happy years, they're profitable ones too. It's a fact that higher education means higher income. Actually, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. Think that over, Bob. Well, naturally, I want my boy to get a college education, Mr. Keating. But it seems kind of early to start worrying about it now. He's just halfway through grammar school. That's where you're wrong, Bob. The sooner you begin planning your boy's college education, the better chance he'll have of getting it. So, the sooner you get the facts about an equitable education fund, the better. Well, what sort of fund is that, Mr. Keating? It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education... The money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the Education Fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, say, Mr. Keating, whom do I see about starting one of these plans? An Equitable Society representative, I suppose. Right, Bob. Get in touch with an equitable man soon. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Above all, don't delay. Start an equitable education fund right away to make sure that when the college bells ring out, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to the FBI file, The Great Deception. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI again illustrates the important fact that there is no geography in crime. A criminal operates when and where he finds the proper accumulation of evil. That may be on the other side of the world, or it may be across the street from where you listen to this program. That is one of the reasons why the Federal Bureau of Investigation cooperates in bringing you this series of programs, so that you, the law-abiding citizen, may know that crime can come anywhere at any time. Your FBI does not want you to be constantly suspicious of everyone or anything, but it does want you to be alert. In the words of director J. Edgar Hoover, wherever law and order break down, there you will find public indifference. And wherever law and order break down, there you will also find the FBI. But public indifference can do more to aid the criminal than your FBI can do to harm him. For that reason, it is important to you individually and to the nation as a whole that all of you bend your every effort in aiding the forces of law and order to conquer the current crime wave. Without you, that crime wave cannot be conquered.
Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Well, Bob, we're making progress. I've covered a lot of ground since this morning. I see you've still got Caldwell's shoes. Yeah, I went over to the bootmakers on the next block after I left here. He recognized the shoes. You mean he made them? No, but he said they looked to him like shoes that were turned out by a custom shoemaker named Hampton. Uh-huh. So I went over to Hampton's shop. I found out this pair of shoes was made for one of their customers. Hmm, did they tell you his name? It's a Peter Clayton. He's a regular customer. Then they had his address. No, the records show that he'd always picked up his shoes. He's never had them delivered. Then we're stymied again. Not this time, Bob. I, I played a hunch. I had the office check passports for me. They found that a Peter Clayton had been issued a passport with a visa for France. Well, it was a good hunch, Jim. The French embassy showed me Clayton's request. His stationery had a Broadway address on it. It was Clayton's office, so I went there. Did you see him? No, he wasn't in, but I spoke to his secretary and got his home address. Where does he live? At North Centerville. I called the office here for help, and the place is now under surveillance. Well, that's about an hour's ride out in the island, isn't it? It is by train, but we can make it a little quicker than that in the car. I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Sergeant Fulton out in North Centerville. Oh, yes, Sergeant. I have a report for you. Fine, let's have it. One of our patrolmen called to report a minute ago. Part of his detail is the 12th Street Bridge. Yes. He reported that someone jumped off the bridge and committed suicide. It was Peter Clayton. Right over here, Mr. Taylor. This is where the man jumped. How do you know that, officer? Well, this is where I found his clothes in the suicide note. No, I see. You, uh, you didn't see him go off the bridge, did you? No, I didn't. Did you, uh, just stumble onto his effects? Oh, no, I was told to come here by headquarters. Oh? They received a phone call from a man who said he happened to be passing by and saw someone jump in the river. Tell me, do you know where this man called from? Yeah, a place at the end of the bridge. Joe's Diner. It's open all night. I see. What did you do with Clayton's effects? I brought them to his wife, and she said the clothes belonged to him. Mm-hmm. What was her reaction? She read the note and collapsed. I see. Officer, how far is uh, Clayton's house from here? Oh, just a few blocks down the road. Thanks. I think I'll get over and interview the widow. Just a minute. Mrs. Clayton? Yes. Are you from the police? I'm a special agent of the FBI, Mrs. Clayton. Oh. Here are my credentials. Please come in. Thank you. I'm awfully sorry to have to bother you at a time like that. Have they found anything yet? No, ma'am. Mrs. Clayton, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor. Yes, surely. What is it you want? Do you still have the note that the police brought you? The note Peter wrote? Yes, ma'am. It's there, on the table. May I have it, please? Will you return it? Yes, yes, surely. Mr. Taylor? Yes? The things the police told me about my husband, are they true? I'm afraid so, yes. Uh, I just can't conceive it. As far as I knew, well, he was just in a regular business. I understand. Well, I think I'll be going now. Thank you, Mrs. Clayton, for your courtesy. Hello? Hello, Peter. Elizabeth, where are you calling from? I'm in a phone booth in the drugstore. Ah, How's it working? Better than you even thought it would. Fine. The man from the FBI was at the house. Oh, what did he want? He wanted to get the suicide note you left on the bridge. Did he give any special reason? No. Uh Uh-huh. Did you let him have it? Yes. Did he sound convinced about my death? Completely. You're in the clear. Only temporarily, I'm afraid. Uh, What do you mean? Well, when my body isn't found, they'll get suspicious. But inasmuch as this was just a delaying action, we'll now have plenty of time to really disappear. How long do you want me to stay here? How soon can you get away? Any time. Hire a car and chauffeur and drive right up. You have the directions. Yes. Is the hotel crowded? You don't think I'd come here if it was. This is a winter resort. It's out of season. In fact, it's a perfect spot for a man who has just committed suicide. Jim. 
Jim. Hmm? Have you finished your report on the Clayton case yet? No, Bob. I've been busy most of the day. You been assigned to a new case yet? No, not yet. Jim, will you go along with me on something? What is it? Will you hold back the Clayton report for a little while? <laughs> You're a little suspicious of that one, too. Yes. I went over Clayton's record last night. He just doesn't seem to be the kind of a man who commits suicide. Well, that's the same conclusion I've come to. Then I guess I won't look too foolish when I tell you that I spent most of the day at the morgue. There's been no trace of Clayton's body. Makes our theory look even better. Uh-huh. I spent most of my time today at the lab. I had the handwriting experts check the suicide note and the signature on those forged army orders. It's their opinion they were both written by the same man. With that evidence, they could convict Clayton on the murder charge. Yes, if he's alive. Uh, excuse me. Special Agent Hudson. This is Sergeant Fulton up in North Centerville. Is Mr. Taylor in? Just a moment. It's Sergeant Fulton for you, Jim. Oh, yeah. I had the suicide note delivered to him so he could return it to Mrs. Clayton. Oh. Thanks, Bob. Hello, Sergeant. I went out to return that suicide note, Mr. Taylor, as soon as your messenger gave it to me. Mrs. Clayton is still hysterical? I don't know. She was gone. What? A neighbor said she left an hour ago with luggage. I don't like that. Sergeant, uh, wait for us at her house. We'll be right out. Bob, Mrs. Clayton left her home this morning, complete with luggage. Uh -oh. Come on, we better drive out there and find out where she went. <laughs> Bob, I've just finished talking to the neighbor who told the sergeant she saw Mrs. Clayton leave. According to her, Mrs. Clayton was picked up by a car and chauffeur. Well, it wasn't her own car. I checked. Theirs are still in the garage. Oh, it's a friend's car. I don't think it is, Bob. Not with a chauffeur. I have a hunch it was rented. Oh, but there's no place in North Centerville where you can rent a car and a chauffeur. No, but there are plenty of those places in town. Let's get back to the office and start checking. <laughs> Found the place, Bob. It's the Ajax Auto Rental Service. Did they know where she was going? No, but they did say she rented a car for 12 hours, starting at 10.30 this morning. Well, it could be that her trip would take six hours each way. Yeah. That means the chauffeur won't be back until 10.30 tonight. It also means we've got seven and a half hours to sit here and wait. Jim, we've got to assume now that she's on her way to meet her husband. Now, the only thing we can do until we hear from that chauffeur is send out another alarm over the wire on Clayton. No, sir. No, sir, we can do more than that. You just reminded me of something. Why, well, what's that? We've still got Clayton's picture, haven't we? Why, well, surely. Why? I've got an idea. Let's get that picture and take a little ride. More coffee, Peter? No, thank you, dear. You're not eating much breakfast. <laughs> I've missed that these past few days. Why? You're saying I'm not eating much breakfast. Well, it's true. You always read your paper. Well, you always keep talking. <laughs> All that's missing now is our engagements for the week. Oh, heavens. What? I just remembered. I never canceled our dinner engagement with the Flippins. Darling, inasmuch as I'm presumably at the bottom of the river, I think they'll understand. Peter. Yes, dear. When are we leaving this hotel? You just arrived. Is it safe for us to stay here? Mm, temporarily, yes. After all, I changed my name, my appearance. That's true. Peter, I still think I should write to them. Who? The Flippins. After all, I'm not at the bottom of the river. <laughs> Who's that? Oh, probably valet service. I called them. Will you let them in, dear? I'll get my dress. Okay. Yes? Hello, Mr. Clayton. I'm uh, afraid you have the wrong room. My name is Cameron. It's been a number of things before that. We're special agents of the FBI. We have a warrant here for the arrest of you and your wife. It can't prove anything. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to prove that you didn't commit suicide, and neither did that soldier in Paris. <laughs> Peter Clayton, before being extradited, was turned over to local authorities who wanted him on a swindling charge. These authorities sentenced him to life imprisonment. His wife, Elizabeth, was given a five-year sentence in state court on charges of conspiracy. The suspicions entertained by the two special agents of your FBI that Peter Clayton had not actually committed suicide were investigated and found to be true. 
Special Agent Taylor learned from the policeman who had gotten the telephone call reporting the suicide that the call had come from Joe's Diner, an all-night lunchroom located near the bridge. When Taylor went to the diner and showed Peter Clayton's picture to the counterman, he identified Clayton as the man who had made the telephone call reporting the suicide. Armed with the knowledge that Clayton was still alive, Taylor then proceeded to the address supplied by the auto rental service, the address to which they had taken Mrs. Clayton. And thus, a murder committed some 3,500 miles away. A wanton murder that took place in Paris was solved through the cooperation of the Paris Surette, of the local police of North Centerville, and of your FBI. Cooperation that today makes the Federal Bureau of Investigation part of an international force which is fighting the criminals of the world every hour of every day. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last question on the Equitable Education Fund. Uh, Mr. Keating, how old should a child be when you start one of these plans for him? Any age, from one week old on up. Remember, the younger the child is when you start his Equitable Education Fund, the lower the yearly cost is to you, because you spread the total amount over more years. So the sooner you act, the better. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative right away. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case history of the operations of a group of female bandits. Its subject, robbery. Its title, Deadlier Than the Male. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Deadlier than the mail on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.